on in the shaping of America, there was a spirit of adventure and self-determination in the early settlers that would help them to forge their way westward across the rugged and untamed American wilderness. But more than anything else, it was their firearms that gave them the courage they needed to settle the American frontier. This is the story of the guns that went west. The old west. You know, if you look hard enough, you can still see a few reminders of those days. Rugged land, wide open spaces, just waiting for a man to stake a claim and call it home. Hi, I'm Hoyt Axton. In the next hour, we're going to take a look at the men and the guns that cut a path westward, searching for freedom and a better way of life. Now, these early settlers were determined people willing to undergo the hardships of severe winters, hostile Indians, dangerous animals, and the unknown of an unexplored land. To help conquer these obstacles, they had the best available firearms. Firearms that would help to put them on a more equal basis with the rugged environment of the American frontier. When we talk about the West, we think about the area west of the Mississippi River and beyond the Pacific. However, to the American colonists, the West was first Ohio, Kentucky, Tennessee, and even western New York and Pennsylvania. It was a frontier explored by brave adventurers, men such as Christopher Gist and Daniel Boone. As early as 1753, Christopher Gist had blazed a trail opening Ohio. And shortly thereafter, Daniel Boone would open Kentucky and Tennessee before continuing even farther west. Prior to the colony's war for independence, the move west had already started. There was a vast land ripe for the taking. All that was needed by these early pioneers was ambition and the right tools. Firearms were abundant in North America by the close of the American Revolution. By that time, they had already been imported here from Europe for over 100 years. The War of Independence and the new westward expansion had stimulated the trade in firearms. And in fact, an entire firearms industry developed in America to keep up with the demand. These firearms were known as flintlocks. And they relied upon sparks to fire the guns, just as we rely on sparks to light our cigarette lighters. The hammer, or cock as it was originally called, holds a small piece of flint firmly between two jaws that work like a vice. Directly in front of the hammer, a shallow dish called the pan holds a small quantity of finely ground black gunpowder. The pan cover is connected to a steel striking surface called the frizzen. Upon release of the hammer, the flint is struck against the steel face of the frizzen, producing sparks of hot steel as the frizzen and pan cover are forced away from the pan, exposing the priming powder. The fire or flash is transmitted from the pan through the touch hole in the barrel to the main powder charge, thus firing the gun. It sounds complicated and undependable, not something you'd want to stake your life upon, but the early gun makers were very careful and the flintlock did work well. Of course, you had to keep your powder dry and be careful of gusts that might blow the powder out of the pan. On a rainy day, well, just hope you didn't have to shoot. The function of the flintlock mechanism was such an integral part of daily life on the frontier that it created many old sayings that we often hear today. For example, flash in the pan. The powder in the pan ignited, but the gun never actually fired. Or how about going off half cocked? In the days of the flintlocks, guns often fired prematurely before the marksman was really ready. We use these terms every day without a clue to their origins, and it just goes to show how big a part these flintlocks played in the daily lives of the early Americans. A flintlock in the hands of a skilled shooter was able to fire four shots in one minute. The shooter first pours a measured amount of powder down the barrel. The projectile is then rammed into the barrel and tightly seated against the powder charge. 
The touch hole is cleared of obstruction with a pick, and the pan is primed and the frizz and rotated into position. Take careful aim. Fire. Three types of flintlock long arms went west in 1803, each with a specific purpose. These were mostly the military surplus guns left over after the American Revolution, like the English Brown Bess muskets captured from the British and the American-made Committee of Safety muskets. The English Brown Bess muskets had been used in North America for over a hundred years. They earned a solid reputation for both their reliability and durability. This early flint musket can have its roots traced back to 1685, when durable military flintlocks were produced by the English gunmaker William Wilson for England's King James II. The barrels and other iron mountings of the brown bess were treated with a chemical process, giving those parts a rich brown color that may account at least partly for the name of the gun, although no true origin of the name has ever been found. The brown bess was made in many variations. In general, three different models are recognized. The first model, or long land model, was produced from 1710 to 1760. They were manufactured primarily at the British Royal Gunneries in Birmingham and at the Tower of London. This model featured a long 46-inch barrel, which was fine for use on the battlefields of Europe, but they were cumbersome in the wilderness and would eventually prove to be a disadvantage during some of the British campaigns in North America. Because of the demand for a musket suitable for wilderness fighting, a new 42-inch barrel was tested that would lead to the development of a second model of Brown Bess. This model was known as the short land model. The shorter barrel length and lighter overall weight of this model made it less unwieldy than its predecessor. It would become the standard British issue from 1760 to the mid-1770s. Probably the most popular of the brown best muskets used in the American colonies was the third model. This model was often referred to as the India pattern. This version of the brown best was originally made for the British East India Company in the late 1760s, and it was both traded and sold in the colonies. It had a short 39-inch barrel that made it much easier to transport in the wilderness. Because of its popularity, it became one of the long arms used by the Continental Army against the British troops during the War of Rebellion. The other surplus muskets carried west after the Revolution were those made in America under contract to the Continental Congress. These long arms were sometimes called Committee of Safety muskets. They were the firearms furnished to the various state militia that were being organized clandestinely in 1775 to fight the British. The Committee of Safety muskets were close copies of the Brown Bess, or the French Charleville, with barrels in lengths from 42 to 46 inches. These muskets were fairly plentiful and were available inexpensively after the war. The second major group of flintlock long arms were the trade muskets. Made in Europe for trade in North America, they were one of the most desirable items to trade to the Indians in exchange for furs. They were also purchased by the many farmers and settlers who were outfitting to move westward. The trade muskets were simple and inexpensive flintlocks decorated with brass, usually featuring a serpent-style side plate on the left side of the stock. Since these guns were of cheap wood, they were often stained red to make them even more showy and appealing to the Indians. The guns also carried a trademark, often in the form of a fox. It was a meaningful symbol to the Indians, and it gave the trade muskets even further significance in their culture. The only trouble was, the Indians had become accustomed to trading with the British for these guns, and that was creating big problems for America. The British were very good businessmen. Early on, they figured out it was cheaper and easier to trade cheap goods for beaver pelts than it was to trap the beavers themselves. And it didn't take them long to figure out that the Indians really wanted guns. So because the British-owned Hudson Bay Company had been the first to supply them with firearms like these, 
The Indians continued to trade furs directly with them long after we won the War of Independence. Many Americans wanted to trade with the Indians in the lucrative market for beaver pelts, but the English were just too well established with the Indians. As a result of the British trade in firearms, our new country was losing out on the valuable riches of the West. But the Lewis and Clark expedition would help change all that. In a bold attempt to gain an advantage over the British, President Thomas Jefferson sent Lewis and Clark on an expedition that would help further establish the western part of North America as part of the United States and establish relations with new Indian tribes along the way. On July 5, 1803, Lewis and Clark left St. Louis, Missouri on a trip that would take them to the end of the Missouri River, then west until they reached the shores of the Pacific Ocean. Jefferson equipped Lewis and Clark with U.S. muskets called the Musket of 1795, which were manufactured at the U.S. Armory in Springfield, Massachusetts. Between 1795 and 1814, the Springfield Armory produced 80 to 85,000 of these flintlocks. The model of 1795 represented many firsts in the production of U.S. military armaments. It was the first firearm made officially for the new United States government it was also the first weapon produced by a U.S. armory, and it had interchangeable parts making it the first American standardized military arm. One of the most unique guns carried west on this expedition was a repeating air rifle similar to this one, manufactured by Jacob Coons of Philadelphia. This air rifle had a large reservoir located under the stock. It could be fired rapidly by simply cocking and inserting a new round ball projectile. Lewis and Clark used it to kill small game birds and animals, and more importantly, they used it to impress the Indians and to help win them over. Upon return of the expedition to St. Louis on September 23, 1806, Lewis and Clark brought back reports of friendly Indian tribes and an abundance of beaver and other fur animals. The pathway to the riches of the American West had become a little broader. The first people to follow the path cut by Lewis and Clark were the mountain men. The men who trapped beavers and traded with the Indians were solitary individuals who enjoyed the isolation and solitude of the wilderness. They were equipped with the third major type of flintlock firearm that went west, the long rifle. It was the weapon of choice for the hunters, trappers, and traders that would open the interior of North America. The most desirable flintlock long arms were made in Pennsylvania, manufactured by numerous independent gun makers. These long rifles had been nicknamed Kentucky rifles because they had been carried into Kentucky by the early frontiersmen. The Pennsylvania rifles were so popular that from 1750 to 1850, over a thousand different makers had been recorded. Their rare curly maple or tiger maple stocks were in such demand that it was not uncommon for gun makers to flame the wood in order to fake the desired effect. This graceful rifle was an improvement on the German Jaeger rifle which had been brought to this country in the late 1690s. The Jaeger rifle was a fine hunting arm, perfectly suited for the woods of Europe, but it was difficult to load and not really suitable for the frontier. The Pennsylvania gunmakers streamlined the Jaeger to improve its balance and its ability to be easily transported through the wilderness. More importantly, they developed a method for placing the round ball projectile into the barrel faster and easier. A rifle is different from a smoothboard musket. This is the actual interior of the smoothbore. By comparison, notice that the rifle barrel has several spiral grooves cut into the inner walls of the barrel. This spiral twist causes the bullet to rotate as it's being pushed out of the barrel, thus giving the projectile a spinning motion, just like a fastball. This improves the accuracy of the rifle by stabilizing the flight of the projectile. The Pennsylvania rifles had earned a reputation during the American Revolution for their deadly accuracy. Because of their rifle barrels, they were accurate out to 300 yards or more, compared to muskets that were accurate to little more than 50 yards. Equipped only with a Pennsylvania long rifle, a 
pair of flint pistols across their horses' necks, and a bedroll. The mountain men led their trap-laden pack horses across the mountains in search of new trapping grounds. A flintlock rifle was only good for one shot, so a pair of flint pistols was their backup for close quarters shooting. The pistols would give them two more quick shots before they'd have to reload. Most of the mountain men used British-made pistols similar to these, which were available from the various trade companies. If the mountain man was really successful, he would have a pair of pistols like these built by the same Pennsylvania gunmaker who built his long rifle. Only a select few could afford to own a fine pair of silver-mounted and engraved high-grade pistols. A match set like these might have belonged to one of the handful of mountain men who were actually wealthy gentlemen seeking the peace and solitude of the wilderness. The mountain men seldom, if ever, returned to civilization. They counted on renewing their supplies at the annual summer rendezvous where they traded their furs for supplies and socialized with other trappers. They gambled and drank away the money they earned only to return to the quiet mountains to await next year's rendezvous. Because of their ability to survive in the wilderness, the mountain men earned reputations that quickly became legendary. The story of Hugh Glass is just one of many hundreds of legends still told around campfires today. After a gruesome battle with a grizzly bear that tore open his throat, Glass was left to die. His companion trappers, Jim Bridgers and John Fitzgerald, who had been left to stay with him until he died, soon abandoned Glass, taking his rifle with him. Somehow Glass nursed himself back to health and he managed to track down his two companions and regain his Pennsylvania rifle. Legend has it that Glass forgave Bridgers because at 19 he was young and inexperienced. But he so humiliated Fitzgerald that from that day forth none of the other mountain men would speak with him. The mountain men were a special breed. From their ranks would come men such as Kit Carson and Jim Bridgers, and many others who would lead the next generation of settlers west. And, as you'll see, the evolution of their firearms would play an ever more important role in the opening of the American frontier. By the time the War of 1812 began, the British had become extremely successful in creating Indian unrest against American settlers and fur traders. Increasing dangers of Indian attacks forced many American traders to pull back from the Rocky Mountain regions of the West, resulting in a tremendous slowdown in the American fur trade business and a stranglehold on westward expansion. The intensifying conflict with the Indians led gunmakers to search for an improvement in the slow-loading flintlock, an improvement that would make rapid loading of their firearms possible. One such invention was the breech-loading flintlock by John Hall of Yarmouth, Maine. Hall began experimenting with the design in 1810, and in 1819, after nine years of tinkering, the rifle was eventually produced for a short while by the U.S. government at the Harpers Ferry Armory. The gun was quite unique. It had a breech block that popped out of the top to the rear of the barrel. To load the rifle, the shooter had only to fill the breech block with powder, drop in the ball, and return the breech block to its required position. However, he still had to prime the pan to fire the gun, like a conventional flintlock musket. A small quantity of the hauls were sent west for testing, and the breech loader did improve the speed of loading and firing a flintlock because it didn't require loading from the muzzle. But the seal between the breech block and barrel wasn't tight enough, causing gas and flames to blow back into the shooter's face. Needless to say, the breech-loading flintlock was never a real success. But another innovation in firearms would change everything that had come before it. Alexander Forsyth of Scotland perfected this new style of gun lock, known today as the percussion lock. Patented in April of 1807, the percussion lock eliminated the need for a flint, loose priming powder, a pan, and a frizzen. In their place was a drum connected to the barrel with a hollow nipple attached to it, directly below the arc of the firearm's hammer. 
A copper cup filled with a chemical compound called fulminate of mercury is placed on top of the nipple. This percussion firing cap, when struck, ignites, sending a fire flash to the powder charge, firing the gun. With the development of the percussion system, firearms designs were simplified. All that was needed to fire the gun was a percussion cap and a hammer to strike the cap. By 1820, the flintlock was virtually obsolete in the United States. Oddly enough, only the U.S. military would maintain the old, slower ignition system of the flintlock. The gunsmiths of Pennsylvania were quick to change to the new ignition system. They now produced their famous rifles with percussion locks and were actively converting all of their earlier made rifles to the percussion system. In St. Louis, Jacob Hawkins started producing rifles which would soon become popular with the fur trapping trade. The Hawken rifle was different from the full-stocked Pennsylvania rifle and had only a half-stock. The half-stocks were cheaper and easier to manufacture than the long full-stock of the Pennsylvania rifles, which were very fragile and easily broken, requiring frequent repairs. Furthermore, the rifles were shorter in overall length and were easier to carry. This style of rifle soon became known as the Plains Rifle. New names were beginning to appear on firearms, names that are still recognized to this day. America was fast becoming the world leader in firearms design and manufacture. In 1816, Eliphalet Remington began making flintlock rifles in Ilium Gorge, New York. By 1828, he had started to produce percussion rifles and shotguns. But it was a sailor named Sam Colt, whose name more than any other, would be remembered for his contribution to the evolution of American firearms. In the search to perfect a true repeating firearm, many things had been tried, but none had been very successful until a design by Colt. From a block of wood, Colt carved a firearm with a revolving cylinder that allowed for five rapid shots without reloading. Colt patented his new design in 1836 and began production in Patterson, New Jersey of the Colt revolving pistol. Colt's revolver was so well liked, he immediately set about producing an entire series of new pistols. The Patterson Colts, as they are called, were popular, particularly in Texas, where they had been purchased by the newly formed Texas Rangers. However, Colt could not generate enough interest in this revolver to keep his New Jersey factory operating. Though Colt's patent on the first practical revolver would lead the way for a change in firearms, the Colt Patterson factory would eventually go bankrupt. But Colt was not one to quit. He was so enthusiastic about his revolving cylinder guns that he commissioned the famous artist George Catlin to paint depictions of hunters using many of the Colt revolving firearms. At great personal expense, Colt continued to promote his ideas and designs, including many of the revolving cylinder rifles. Colt's revolving cylinder idea was very practical for handguns, but the results were not nearly as good when applied to long arms. Nonetheless, a great many revolving long arms were manufactured. The gap between the barrel and the revolving cylinder allowed dangerous hot gases, sparks, and other fragments to escape, and made these guns relatively hazardous to fire. The result was that the revolving rifles never really caught on. Colt, however, would go on to make many of the most popular and innovative firearms ever produced. As the trappers moved further westward looking for new hunting grounds, a new group of individuals followed their path. These were the farmers and settlers in pursuit of a better and more productive land. Land available for the taking. They settled in Illinois, Missouri, Arkansas, and in 1820, Moses Austin filed with the Spanish governor in Texas to bring 300 families to Texas for colonization. Moses Austin received a land grant of 200,000 acres in Texas, but died in 1821 before he could move these families there. However, his son Stephen Austin carried out his father's wish and began the American colonization of the Spanish-held territory of Texas. The settlers' main concern was clearing the land and making it fit for planting. They generally had only one firearm, and it was usually a smoothbore. The guns the farmers and settlers chose were the inexpensive fowling pieces, or shotguns as we call them today. 
These can be used as a shotgun for moving targets such as birds and rabbits, or loaded with a charge of buck and ball for bigger game. That was a load that included one large ball about the diameter of the bore and several pellets of buckshot approximately a quarter inch in diameter. This type of load was also a very good defense load and had been used by the military for many years. These smooth bore guns were generally sold by the bore size or gauge of the barrel, generally 10, 12, 14, 16, or 20 bore. This bore or gauge size is determined by making a round ball the same diameter as the barrel and then calculating how many balls of that size make one pound. Surplus flintlock military muskets made by the U.S. Armory at Springfield or Harpers Ferry were in abundance. Many of these guns were left over from the War of 1812 and had been converted to percussion by the Western Outfitting Companies. By 1840, the trail to Oregon was well known by the fur traders. These mountain men found a new use for their skills by leading wagon trains loaded with farmers to western lands. The first wagon train left Missouri and traveled 1,835 miles to Oregon in 1842. It was led by Elijah White, who was heading to Oregon for his new post as Indian agent. This opened the way west, and soon many wagon trains would follow this route. The continent had been expanded from coast to coast. Now all that was necessary was to keep the trails open and protect the citizens from hostiles. The U.S. government founded many forts along the westward trails and worked hard to keep the trails open. But the military was still armed with the old-style flintlock musket. Oftentimes, even the settlers were equipped with more modern firearms. Their shotguns were as accurate at short ranges as the military musket. Even the Indians were as well equipped. The flintlock musket was well suited to the hostile Indians because they had an abundance of flint and could use small rocks as projectiles. It's amazing how well the Indians adapted to firearms and how quickly they realized their importance as an equalizer. In 1835, Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana, the president of Mexico, declared himself a dictator and decreed martial law in Texas, attempting to disarm the many American colonizers who had settled there. The Texans countered and moved to free themselves from Mexico. We all know the story of the Battle of the Alamo. David Crockett, James Bowie, and their Tennesseans armed with their Pennsylvania long rifles, fought a gallant battle. They lost, but their loss led to Texas becoming an independent republic. The Pennsylvania long rifle had now fought well in three major wars. It had carved a place in history as one of the most accurate rifles ever made, first in the American Revolution, then in the War of 1812, and finally at the Battle of the Alamo. On December 29, 1845, United States President James K. Polk signed a proclamation making Texas a state. This infuriated the President of Mexico and he declared war on the United States. Only nine years after winning its independence, Texas was again at war. Captain Samuel H. Walker of the U.S. Mounted Rifle, who was about to leave for the fight, ordered one of the significant firearms produced for the Mexican-American War. This firearm was a large 44 caliber revolver manufactured by Samuel Colt at the Whitneyville Armory in New Haven, Connecticut. This massive 4-pound, 9-ounce revolver, known as the Colt Walker 1847 model, was the most powerful percussion revolver ever manufactured. More importantly, its production helped establish Colt as a manufacturer of fine revolvers. Revolvers which would play an important role in the taming of the American West. In 1846, the U.S. government was producing several types of long arms. One of these, produced at the U.S. Armory at Harper's Ferry, was the Model 1841. A percussion rifle nicknamed the Mississippi because of its popularity with the troops from that region who fought under Jefferson Davis in the Mexican War. The Mississippi rifle is truly one of the most handsome guns made by the U.S. government. It was equipped with a large patch box on the right side of the stock that made it quite distinctive.
Captain Walker was not very pleased with any of the long arms issued to his troops by the military. Instead of these, he ordered a fine-made 44 caliber rifle by one of America's great target rifle makers, Edwin Wesson. Walker painted a pretty picture for Wesson, telling him that he was raising the money to purchase 1,000 rifles for his troops to use in Mexico. Although the order for 1,000 was never issued, a memo in Wesson's daybook indicates that Walker did purchase several Wesson rifles to use in the fight. One of the individuals who helped build Walker's Wesson rifles was a young gunsmith who was apprenticed to his brother. This gunsmith was Daniel Baird Wesson, who, in another six years, would start his own gun company and become one of the giants in the arms world. While the U.S. was at war with Mexico, another important westward advance was taking place. The Mormon community that built the small city called Nauvoo on the Mississippi River in Illinois had run into trouble with local citizens. The leader of the Mormons had been killed, and in his place they elected Brigham Young. Young decided to move the entire settlement farther west. Between 1847 and 1848, Brigham Young successfully moved 4,248 individuals and more than 3,500 cattle to the area of the Great Salt Lake in Utah. When Young saw the Great Salt Lake, he declared that this was the place he had been searching for. From here, these people spread out to further settle the land. One of the Mormons who had made the move to Utah was a gunmaker named Jonathan Browning. Browning provided many of the firearms needed by the army that Brigham Young had formed to protect his flock. Browning produced a wide variety of rifles, generally similar to that of the Hawken and other styles of plains rifles popular at the time. Browning also experimented with a number of different repeaters, like this revolving cylinder design. It was capable of firing six shots without reloading. One of the more unique percussion rifles produced by Jonathan Browning was this slide bar repeating rifle. This rifle used a flat block of steel into which had been drilled five holes. Each chamber had to be charged with powder and ball, and each had to be individually primed as well. The block was moved, placing a chamber in line with the barrel and the priming cap under the hammer. After each shot, the block was simply indexed to the next load, and the rifle was ready to fire again. Other than the Colt revolver, Browning's repeater was one of the few firearms that offered the shooter more than one shot without reloading. Jonathan Browning not only contributed to the growth of the arms industry, but started a family tradition as a gunmaker. His son, John Mose Browning, born in Ogden, Utah in 1855, would later become the greatest gun designer to emerge out of the western frontier. About the same time Brigham Young was busy starting his settlement in Utah, John H. Sutter and his workmen made a startling discovery in California that would shake up the entire world. While constructing a mill race on his land east of Sacramento, California, the workmen discovered gold. The word traveled like wildfire. The largest rush west was on. Individuals with dreams of easy riches left home and headed west across the great expanse of this country. Many of these people followed poorly written guidebooks written by completely inexperienced travelers of the plains. By May 1849, it was reported that 5,000 wagons were plodding westward. Two weeks later, an observer reported 12,000 wagons had crossed the Missouri River, heading west for El Dorado. The search for gold and silver and the possibility of becoming enormously wealthy spurred the imagination and did more to open the West than any other factor before. It also did more to enrage the Indians as prospectors moved into their sacred grounds. The toll was large. More than 5,000 lives were lost in 1848, and many who left loved ones in the East were never heard from again. The push west for gold created the demand for a different kind of firearm. Yes, the travelers needed their rifles, but they all felt the need for a pistol to protect themselves and all the gold they would hopefully find. 
rocket pistols were really in demand. They were tiny but deadly at close range. Small Henry Derringers made in Philadelphia were available if you could afford them. And there were many less expensive models produced by all the gunsmiths that copied Derringer. In fact, the small Derringer pistols were so popular that the word Derringer came to be used to describe all small pistols. The Allen Thurber single-shot bar pistol was known as a fast-action single-shot handgun. It was one of the most popular of the small pocket pistols and was carried for protection by many of the gold miners. One of the first double action designs, the Allen pistol, could be cocked and fired in one simple action by simply squeezing the trigger. Always ready for action, it could be carried safely until needed, then drawn and quickly fired without wasting precious seconds to cock the hammer. The single shot Allen Thurber pistols would do fine, but even better, an Allen Thurber six shot pepper box pistol. The pepper box was like a revolver, except it was actually six barrels all clustered together. Each barrel was simply rotated into position and then fired. The pepper box pistols had been designed especially to circumvent Colt's patent on the revolving cylinder. They would become some of the most popular handguns made between 1836 and 1860. A whole series of pepper box designs would hit the market, including a few rifles. One of the more interesting designs was the Briggs revolving rifle. Often called a goose gun or volley gun, the Briggs rifle had six heavy full-length barrels, each of which had to be rotated by hand into its proper firing position. At well over 10 pounds, it can best be described as cumbersome, to say the least. More than any other firearm, it was the Colt pocket model of 1849 in 31 caliber that was truly the handgun all of the gold miners wanted. But the Colt firearms were so popular, any Colt revolver would do. The 31 caliber 1849 model Colt was certainly favored, but even the heavy Dragoon models in 44 caliber were sought after. The black powder used in these early percussion revolvers caused a buildup of dirt and carbon called fouling that required frequent disassembly of the revolvers for cleaning. The difficult loading process was also much easier once the cylinder was removed. Because of time involved to load these pistols, a spare loaded cylinder was often carried for backup. Each of the cylinder's six charge holes were first filled with the proper amount of powder. At this point, the pistol was reassembled so that the projectiles, either round balls or conical bullets, could be properly seated on top of the powder charge in each chamber. A ball was placed on top of a charge and the cylinder was then rotated under the loading lever on the underside of the barrel. The lever was then pulled down, forcing the ball into the cylinder hole. This was continued until all six bullets were tightly seated. Then a layer of grease was spread over each of the balls resting in the charge holes. This prevented the flash from one charge hole from igniting the other loads in the cylinder when the gun was fired. When the cylinder was completely loaded, percussion caps were then placed on the nipples at the rear of each chamber, and the revolver was ready to fire. fields were dangerous, filled with claim jumpers, robbers, Indians, and drunken miners. And the cities of California were also dangerous. Guidebooks warned the miners never to enter them unarmed. The move westward and the need for better protection increased the demand for arms, and resulted in a new emphasis on better firearms.
In 1849, Christian Sharps invented a breech-loading percussion rifle that was to become one of the most popular rifles of the American frontier. Sharps had received his training at the Harpers Ferry Armory under the tutelage of John Hall, inventor of the Hall breech-loading flintlock. In 1852, Sharps introduced an improved rifle called the Slanting Breech Model of 1852 that used a slanted breech block which sealed the rear of the barrel. By moving the trigger guard forward, the breech block was dropped out of place for loading. They used a paper cartridge which could be quickly loaded in the rear of the barrel. The early guns were primed with a regular percussion cap or the Sharps priming pills. The Sharps rifles were originally manufactured under contract by the Robbins and Lawrence Company of Windsor, Vermont. But Sharps later began production in Hartford, Connecticut when his own manufacturing facilities were completed there. The Sharps became a workhorse of the western frontier and would be used for many years to come. And New England was continuing to grow as the firearms producing capital of the United States. In 1852, Daniel B. Wesson and Horace Smith joined forces in an effort to design an improved repeating firearm. And together they formed a company called Smith & Wesson that would become one of the world's leading firearms manufacturers. Their first design was a lever-action repeater. It was a 16-shot pistol using a new type of rocket bullet. Under the barrel, a tubular magazine could be filled with 16 bullets. To operate the pistol, the hammer was first cocked, then the trigger guard lever was pushed forward and then back to its original position, raising a bullet into the chamber. The so-called rocket bullet used by Smith & Wesson in their early lever-action repeaters was a fully self-contained cartridge that required no external primer. The hollow-based bullet was filled with a propellant, and it had an internal percussion cap of mercury fulminate that was ignited when struck by the hammer. When the gun was reviewed by Scientific American in 1854, the reviewers were so impressed that they related its rapid fire power to an erupting volcano. The nickname stuck and the pistol would come to be known as the Volcanic. But the design of the Volcanic bullet had serious flaws. When loaded into the magazine, the tip of one bullet rested against the priming mechanism of the next. On rare occasions, the gun's recoil could ignite every bullet in the magazine. Smith and Wesson realized the limitations of the volcanic bullet. So in 1855, they sold control of their company to a shirt manufacturer by the name of Oliver Winchester. He moved the company to New Haven, Connecticut and changed the name to the Volcanic Arms Company to capitalize on the gun's popular nickname. But Smith and Wesson didn't quit. In 1854, they had patented a design for a new self-contained cartridge that we know today as the Rimfire. The cartridge case was made of copper, and at its base, a small rim was filled with the percussion material composed of mercury fulminate. The case was filled with powder, and a round ball or conical bullet was seated in the mouth of the case, sealing off the powder from dampness. When the rim of the case was struck by the hammer, the percussion compound ignited, and the cartridge fired. With the sale of their original company completed, Wesson began development of a new firearm that would use the rimfire cartridge. In 1856, he completed the design of a new seven-shot cartridge revolver, the world's first. When Colt's exclusive patent for the revolving cylinder expired in 1857, Smith and Wesson began production of their 22 caliber cartridge revolver. The success of this new revolver and its fully self-contained waterproof cartridge firmly established a new Smith & Wesson. The Smith & Wesson Revolver Company of Springfield, Massachusetts. Oliver Winchester, on the other hand, was suffering through rough times. He had invested heavily in the Smith & Wesson Lever Action Pistol, and his decision to change the name of the business to the Volcanic Arms Company did nothing to improve his sales. Rather than relying on the sales of pistols alone, Winchester also introduced both rifles and carbines to his line. And for the second time in two years, he renamed his company, calling it the New Haven Arms Company. The company's rifle circular sounded exciting, proclaiming 30 charges can be loaded and discharged in 50 seconds. 
But Winchester's lever-action firearms were still plagued by the problems of the volcanic bullet. The 1857 model pistol was destined to become the last of the volcanics. The lever-action designs that Smith & Wesson had perfected were innovations that would lead the way toward many successful repeating firearms. But the volcanics themselves were destined to fail. It was a Winchester shop foreman named Benjamin Tyler Henry who eventually saved Oliver Winchester's large investment. Henry redesigned the volcanic rifle to use the Smith & Wesson rimfire cartridge. His design would become one of the truly great American firearms, a rifle that would fill the needs of the western frontier. Winchester obtained an agreement from Smith & Wesson to use their rimfire cartridge design and in 1860 he introduced the 44 caliber Henry repeating rifle. The gun, people said, could be loaded on Sunday and shot all week. The Henry was exactly what people were looking for. The new rifle gave one man the firepower of many. And Winchester knew exactly how to market that. The rifle could be loaded with as many as 16 cartridges and then fired as quickly as the shooter could cock the lever and pull the trigger. Smith & Wesson had developed the toggle action design which made the Henry work. But more importantly, their development of the waterproof rimfire metallic cartridge ended the era of the muzzle-loading firearms forever. The development of the cartridge would change the firearms world. But while Smith and Wesson had been working out the problems of cartridge firearms, new problems were developing throughout the land. Slavery was becoming a key issue as new states joined the Union. The country would be split into two nations while a great civil war was fought. Soon a new westward migration would begin and a new generation would carry the banner west. The Indians would come to feel even more threatened as a new period of expansion would push them even farther from their ancestral lands. The taming of the western frontier would give rise to countless legends that would fill thousands of books and movie screens. George Armstrong Custer, James Butler Hitchcock, William Frederick Cody, and the likes of Jesse James would leave their imprints in the minds and imaginations of all Americans who followed. Their legends and the legendary firearms they carried fill the next chapter of our story. Until then, this is Hoyt Axton. Thank you.